previously on Solve the World. Let me present to you Jennifer Dash, 17 years of age, 5 foot 9, dirty blonde hair that falls just to the small of the back, undeniably pretty, but the type of pretty that doesn't stand out in a crowd. Her charm is as such that in one moment she could easily pass for a tall 14-year-old and then the next pull off that college grad look. You would like her immediately if you met her. Looming over her like a colossus stood a seven-year-old girl outfitted in overalls and a big mouth far from being proportional to the rest of her face. The girl sat on the edge of the couch by Jen's stomach. Who are you? The girl inquired. Foggy-eyed, Jen opened her mouth to respond before realizing she wasn't sure how to answer. For the first time, it dawned on her that she'd never caught the boy's name. He was just the boy. Hi, I'm... I'm Jen. Who, Who are you? My name's Margaret, but everyone calls me Scout. Let me present to you, Atticus Further. Undeniably handsome, but the type of handsome that doesn't stand out in a crowd. His charm is as such that in one moment he could easily pass for a muscly 14-year-old football player and the next pull off that college grad look. You would like him immediately if you met him. And yeah, Miles Faw. Faw's young enough, strong enough, athletic enough to be a good crew member. But he's always looking for a mind he can't control. Usually, that just leaves him thinking about himself. That's the only diamond just beyond his reach, methinks. I told you twice already, now thrice. I'm the resident skeptic. Yeah, but I don't know what that means. A skeptic is someone who practices skepticism. Merriam-Webster's defines skepticism as an attitude of doubt or incredulity, either in general or toward a particular object. Did you really just quote the dictionary at me? (sighs) I have a photographic memory. Come. You follow Marshall Winston through a maze of lives as you beeline past a partially outdoor sanctuary. Do you believe in the Pied Piper? Uh, the Pied Piper? Like the old fairy tale? Jen wasn't sure where she had heard the old folk legend, but it was rattling around in her memory banks nonetheless. Uh, I've never thought about it. He's real, let me tell you. The weird topic would have intrigued Jen had Dahl been a less aloof conversationalist. Yup, he's real. How do you know? He took my daughter. At that, Jen's stomach dropped. Solve the World, a fictional adventure told in 100 episodes. You're a disappointment to me, Jennifer Dash. Episode 80, The End of All Things. You can tell a Shakespeare play by its ending. If all the characters die at the end, a tragedy you watched. If, on the other hand, all the characters end up married, then, it is said, tis a comedy you have entertained. For this reason, Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream is easily recognized as a comedy, and one of Shakespeare's more outlandishly funny ones at that. But a quick glance at the play's last lines reveals deeper truths hidden within the confines of that story. The play comes to an end with a monologue by the servant of Oberon, the fairy king. This servant has the name Robin Goodfellow, but friends call him Puck. The end of Shakespeare's divine fever dream ends this way. Puck says, If we shadows have offended, think but this, and all is mended, that you have but slumbered here while these visions did appear, and this weak and idle theme no more yielding but a dream. Gentles, do not reprehend. If you pardon, we will mend. And as I'm an honest puck, if we have unearned luck, now to escape the serpent's tongue, we will make amends ere long. Else the puck a liar call. So good night unto you all. Give me your hands, if we be friends. And Robin shall restore amends. There's a couple things to catch in this final monologue. The first is Robin's name. Puck. 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 
That's no random monosyllabic nickname. Puck is a derivation of Puka. He is introduced in the play as a knavish sprite and a merry wanderer of the night. In other words, he belongs to the Shining Man. He's died and is under his liege, as all wanderers of the night are. But take this in. Jennifer Dash is headed towards the North Pole. There, the first man, the original Adam, now lending his frame to the world in the form of a Pied Piper, is promising redemption to a conglomerate of demon creations. Time is of the essence because a plague is sweeping the globe and nuclear holocaust is decimating all that grows green. The world is coming to an end. This is the end. We as humans who have yet to die are not comfortable with endings. We prefer to ignore them. Instead of focusing on our collective unavoidable fates, that being our wormy graves, we like to pretend that everything goes on. That's the point of gravestones, isn't it? Gravestones give us a sense of continuation. For the storyteller, though, endings are much more real. This is true because, for good or for ill, the storyteller's stories always come to an end. Shakespeare had to deal with endings on a consistent basis. Even so, the storyteller can elude the consequences of an ending by simply moving forward, telling another story. This, however, is not what the characters get to do. For a character in a story, an ending is an eternity. The end means the end. We see Puck try to deal with this. As the keen ear will hear, his solution is quite intriguing. Think on it. Puck is a character in a fictional universe. He knows as soon as the curtain falls, his story is over. He is over. This then, his final monologue in a comedy, is sufficiently solemn. You have but slumbered here, he says. He knows you don't belong in his universe. You get to go on living. You'll leave the theater and go about your life. This is a luxury Puck is not granted. Shakespearean theater is renowned for its iambic pentameter. This is generally constructed with two five-syllable lines. The even syllables get the beat. It sounds like a heartbeat. Da-dum, 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 da-dum. But to make the fairy kingdom distinct from that of us mortals, Shakespeare gives Puck, and like company, a trochaic tetrameter voice. This sounds like the opposite of us humans. Instead of da-dum, da-dum, it goes dum-da, dum-da. Dumta, ending on the seventh syllable so that each line ends on the hard, accented syllable. The point is simple. Humans and fairies are different, but something changes, merges in Puck's farewell. He begins, If we shadows have offended, think but this and all is mended. This remains in the trochaic form. The odd syllables get the beat, as is the fairy way. But instead of ending in the seventh syllable in each line, it ends on the soft eighth. Why? Listen to the words. If we shadows have offended. This is a platonic idea, no? Puck knows he's not real. He's an imitation of the real. He's not human. He's not non-fictional. He's merely a shadow. Still, he imitates life. So he imitates humanity ending on a soft syllable. After this strange beginning, Puck returns back to classic trochaic tetrameter until the last sentence, which leaves us once more with an eight-syllable soft ending. Give me your hands, if we be friends, and Robin shall restore amends. He ends softly. We all go quietly into the night. But for Puck, there's hope. His story will be retold. He, in his current form, may not live on, but he'll get the chance to act again, returning to the beginning from whence he came. You see, Puck absolves himself of having to deal with the finality of ending. Or, in other words, he whitewashes death by choosing to have faith in the future retelling of his story. Through repetition, he'll live on. In this way, Puck, you see, is both dead and alive. He's dead, or rather dying, because there's no more story to tell. He's alive because his story will be retold. And, optimistic Puck points out to us, perhaps the next time, his story will be told better.
This talk is not merely philosophical. There's some science to back up the belief. Scientists have recently pinpointed neurons that hold within them the information that conjures up our perception of the people we know. For instance, Jennifer Dash has a clump of neurons and connecting tissue inside her brain that make up her recollection of Tiff. Tiff, although now long dead, lives on physically, at least as a shadow, inside Jen's brain. Both our arms and thrust Tiff's head against the floor. Answer me! No response. Another thrust. Head meet the floor. Come on, Tiff, I can barely breathe. I'll kill you right here and now if you don't speak up. Guideline one, don't kill. Answer me now! Tiff said one last time resolutely. Followed you. Set the moment. Followed, 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 followed. The memory of Tiff is a very physically real thing. Tiff's story is over, but in some sense, she lives on, like a bee that's pollinating flower after flower. Tiff's essence was passed on to Jen incrementally every time they shared time together. Tiff will continue in various neurons walking about the earth, until the last person dies who remembers meeting her. Followed, 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 is dead and alive. Tiff is dead and alive. Jennifer Dash, right now, is alive. But as she marched along with the many, she contemplated a death that would encapsulate everyone and everything. The last remains of Tiff would soon be swallowed up so would any chance of Puck living on in a middle school rendition of A Midsummer Night's Dream. All of it, gone. Soon the cat could no more be dead and alive. Only dead. If the world goes away, so does our story, Jen said to herself. Over and over again, she said it in her mind's eye. If the world goes away, so does our story. If the world goes away, so does our story. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay, Scout. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be fine. Just pray. Pray. Pray, Scout. That's all you have to do. This will be over soon. Don't worry. This will be over soon. Atticus called out, his tears meeting his runny nose at the base of his upper lip. He was a mess. He wanted to be there for his little sister. Urgently. Intensely blindly needed to be there for Scout. He walked beside the long wooden plank that Scout lie bound hand and foot to, beside hundreds of other children. Remarkably, only, say, one out of ten children cried out. Most were either heroically stoic or overcome with silence like lambs led to slaughter. What a world this was. Don't fear, okay? Don't be scared. You can't be scared. You don't have to be scared because everything's gonna be fine. Everything's gonna be golden. We'll be home soon. Real soon, you'll see. It's not okay, Scout replied. Her voice was flat. <laughs> Children accept the world they're given. In that way, they're much finer creatures than the rest of us. We rage internally. We drink. We gamble away our lives. They, the children, play room ball when they can. They accept the world they've been handed. Scout had been dealt a bum hand. She'd been born in the wrong generation. The last. Sure, it wasn't fair. She'd never grow old, never get to marry her high school sweetheart, never get to watch her own children discover the manifold intricacies of the universe. These realities were being forcibly robbed from her. She was a pawn sacrifice, about to be shed as a burnt offering to an unknown force, the old gods. Who said religion was dead? That's an answer you can only learn over time. And why is that? Because whatever we are, we become more of that over time. Jen needed answers. Now. Now. More than ever. Time was up. It somehow slipped through her fingers. She might as well have been an old lady filled with a regret, looking to her wrinkled hands to somehow undo all the hurt. 
too much. There was too much, and not enough time to make a dent. Jennifer Dash was barreling down. It was the fourth quarter, fourth down, less than a minute on the clock, and she was down two touchdowns. One Hail Mary alone wouldn't do the trick. She needed back-to-back-to-back miracles. The world was ending. How do you stop that? The procession marched on. Jen found Mrs. Moose amongst the murderous, ageless masses. The old lady, in her more primitive visage, was a lynx. Sort of. No, not a lynx. A sphinx. A lynx sphinx. The classic, mythical creature made immortal by the enormous Egyptian tomb featured a creature with the head of a man and a body of a lion. Mrs. Moose, ironically consisting of no part moose whatsoever, appeared to have the head of an elegant, quite beautiful woman. Cleopatra, maybe, and the body of a lynx, the most medium-sized of the various feline species. Mrs. Moose, please help me, Jen called out to her, clinging to her thick fur as she walked amidst the horrible procession. There's nothing to help anymore, young lady, Mrs. Moose replied. I need answers. Who is the Pied Piper? Really? What's Leviathan? What's the Black Henge? Who's the Shining Man? What am I here for? Is there any meaning to life? To any of this? Where's Lilith Babbitt? Is there a good side and a bad? You said... You... You... You once said you were neutral. You chose the in-between. Are you choosing a side now? Who are you? Why do you look like a cat? Who are all these monsters? Who made them? How old are you? Why have you hidden yourself? The questions were flooding out of Jen's mouth. She stopped herself once she caught her breath. She could have gone on asking, asking, asking. I'm not a storyteller. You need to speak to a storyteller. I don't need stories. I need answers. Answers are only found in stories. I have no need for sympathy any longer. No need for sympathy? What on earth did that mean? Okay, who's the storyteller here? Is there someone who will answer my questions? (laughs) You've always had the best storyteller right by your side. Didn't you notice? No, I... 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 I don't know. Who? The projector. The projector? Jen said, still lost. Miles Faw, said Mrs. Moose. Jen caught her old boatmate's silhouette far off in the line of death. With all her strength, Jennifer Dash ran. Past Atticus, past Scout, past the one she knew as the Pied Piper. Past Marshall Winston. She ran to Miles, falling at his feet. Please! Now! Miles! You know what's happening? I have to know! Don't make me die without knowing! I can't... I can handle death. I can. It'll be okay, but I have to leave this life knowing. I don't want to die in the dark. I don't want to die in the dark. She clutched at the bottom of his pants like a groveling servant at the feet of a king. I don't want to die in the dark. Jen had been on this mission for a lifetime now, but she'd never distilled her mission down to such a simple concept. Jennifer Dash didn't want to die knowing nothing. She wanted to know where her life fit into the cosmos before she passed on. This was her heart's innermost yearning. At the center of all things was this. I don't want to die in the dark. Miles and Jen began to fall behind the main conglomerate. There was a choice for Miles. What would he choose? He could continue to hold back, but what would be the point in that? They'd be through the door soon. Miles wanted Jen to be on the other side, with him, but maybe that was just a fairy tale? Beyond that, there was the real danger now of alienating the girl. Naturally, she finds child sacrifice repugnant. You, Miles, enlightened despot that you are, see beyond good and evil. You see the necessity and the consequence, plus the world's ending. The kids were going to die anyway. So, that was that. Time to fess up. He did. So you'll never believe this. I I make, I create, I form somehow in my mind, my my bowels, whatever, my innermost parts, I, I make a giraffe. 
Miles told Jen all of Piper's story, everything he heard that night listening in on the Piper's annual bar confessional. Jennifer Dash knew. She knew now. Now, she knew. Could it be believed? It had to be. There was no other choice. You have to accept this, old girl, she told herself. Staring into Miles' eyes, there was no reason now to disbelieve. Even if it was false, Miles believed it, and Jen would bet all the ogres did too. Miles, how does this end? We have to go through the door. With the... With the creatures? Pipers? Creations? Yes. Why? It's the easiest thing to do. And the children? The world's dying, Jen. Everyone's dying. Except for us, Jen said snidely. What happens when people die? Most become slaves to the Shining Man. Would I be his slave? I don't know. Don't you care about people, Miles? Don't you care about people at all? It's the only reason I'm doing this. Miles reached out his hand to hold Jen's. She believed him. Of course she did. Miles projected the words. He again was breaking his personal covenant not to project onto Jen. That's not how real love works. It can't be manipulative. It must be freely given and received. But the two of them would have all the time in the world on the other side. Whatever the other side was like, it wouldn't be like this. There wouldn't be a shining man, and that meant no war. Every war, every battle, every conflict, and therefore every story in the history of mankind has its center in the shining man. Without his presence infecting everything, Miles could scarcely imagine what life would be like. Breathing for the first time. Exhaling. A true big breath in. That's what it would be. Jen and Miles could grow in love there. In that place. In the place that the door led to. That's the trick of it. Love was pointless in a war. And that's what life was. Had been. Forever. So yes. Miles projected now. For Jen's good. He held her hand. She allowed him to. They walked for a time, hand in hand, stride in stride. Jen wasn't quite happy, but it was enough. Any sense of security was worth choosing. Atticus didn't see Jen and Miles together. Even if he did, it wouldn't have mattered. Transparency is the only shield against corruption. Atticus prayed and walked beside Scout's position in the long plank. Scout was his life now. Scout and the rebirth of his personal guilt. Here you are in your transparent kingdom, acting like it's hell, while your baby sister rots in the land where no one is there to keep evil in line. Where are the whistleblowers and on mine? Where are the sacred watchdogs? Nowhere. He'd continue to carry that cross, all the way to the Black Henge and beyond. Someone else saw Jen and Miles. It was the last push Marshal Winston needed. Memnock was no longer melting the ground beneath the feet of those peddling in the mass exodus. The reason for this was simple enough. There was no ground to melt. Unlike its polar opposite, the South Pole, the North has no land mass. It is merely ice. Therefore, Memnock merely heated the air above the icy floor. This proved helpful for Marshal Winston, and presumably fatal for the Pied Piper. Spying the Piper's exact location amongst the marauding tribe, Marshall began his search. It didn't take long. The ice below his feet would make for a good snowball, but it wouldn't serve as a certifiable weapon for Marshall. He needed something sharper. Just a little ways to the right of the group, an overhang of ice. An icicle, built perfectly. Long, razor sharp, and strong enough to keep its composition after breaking off. Perfect. Marshall broke off the icicle and made his way to the Piper. Marshal Winston was an assassin. That's what he was. That's what he is. That's what he was going to be. A murdering assassin. Murder assassin. Murder. Go on. Go now. Do it. Marshal Winston couldn't afford to lose time. The icicle melting in his hand already, he ran surreptitiously to the piper. From behind, not with a sacred kiss or greeting, Marshall approached Pied Piper, the one we know now as Adam the Original. Marshall Winston jammed the icicle squarely through Piper's right temple. (sighs) 
The tip of it, Marshal saw, sputted out the other side. Piper's body fell lifeless. He was dead. The fiddler. The fife player. The tormentor was gone, lifelessly dead on the cold ice pack. Blood trickling out both temple wounds. Say it again. Hallelujah. Say it again. Say it again. Say it again. Blue in the face. Six in the stuff. Dead in the side. Hallelujah. Say it again. Hallelujah. Say it again. Hallelujah. Say it again. Say it again. Dead in the side. Hallelujah. Say it again. Hallelujah. Say it again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say it again. Manuscripts, both the translation of the ancient Croatoan and the original text itself, from Piper's dead claws, and Marshall mercilessly tore it to bits. The exodus came to a halt. All eyes were on Marshall. Every piece of paper he tore, he flung into the wind. A quiet breeze hushed the fragments into the distance. Marshall fell to his knees as he tore and tore and ravaged the ancient words. This last thing. Marshall was redeeming his life right here, right now. This last thing. This last effort. He was saving the world, or at least saving the children. An escort of goblins had seized the world story in order to find some chicanery that would transport them to some unknown hell and leave the earth to ruin. Never fear, Marshal Winston's here. To undo it all, the end of all things was nigh, and now not. He tore every last piece to bits with such fury because Marshall knew, was absolutely sure that some monster was coming for him. One of the demons would slice him in two, remove him from himself like his finger was once removed from his hole. The only question was who would do it. Maybe Memnock, maybe Mrs. Moose or Windigo, maybe one of the tall ones, a frost giant or Sasquatch or abominable snowman. It didn't matter who. All that mattered was that he destroyed the manuscripts enough so that they couldn't follow its directions. May the old secrets return to dust and myth. Marshall Winston had a destiny, and it was this. The panic which overtook Marshall while he shredded the Croatoan on his knees blinded him from the activity just beside him. No, none of the old ones were coming to end Marshall. They all just stood and stared. The dead one. Pied Piper, the Fiddler, the Ancient of Days, Adam, whatever you wanted to call him, had arisen. He stood now, his eyes beating down at poor Marshall. The icicle which had slain him remained jaggedly inserted in his cranium. With finesse, he pulled it out, only a few bit parts broken off. The Piper held the icicle in his hands just until Marshall finally rose up his eyes to see his continents. The horror. The horror. With one swoop, Adam used the icicle on Marshall, choosing the left eye instead of the temple as the point of interest. So, good night unto you all. Give me your hands if we be friends, and Robin shall restore amends.
trying to say goodbye. Goodbye. Marshall fell dead, his head laying face down on the packed snow ground that was already stained by Piper's blood. Agape was Jen's mouth. A memory surged into her brain, a conversation with Father Thomas back from the earliest of days on the Orion, back when Jen still struggled with perverse and evil dreams. <laughs> on that night, as memory served, rising from a terrifying nightmare of Tiffin Flusher, Jen arose to find Father Thomas in the ship's galley reading from his Bible. Trying to be friendly, Jen asked Father Thomas, What you reading? He responded, I'm reading the last book of the Bible. Um, which one is that? Jen said. It's called Revelation. Oh, Jen said. Father Thomas, sensing that the mere title of the book was an insufficient answer, went on. The Bible tells us that Jesus, the King of the Jews, according to the Roman epitaph nailed to his cross, had twelve close followers. Of these twelve, one infamously betrayed Jesus, Judas Iscariot, who, racked with never-ending guilt, killed himself. Ten more were executed under persecution after Jesus' death. That left just one follower of the twelve who lived long and was not assassinated. One out of twelve. John the Apostle, and even him, as an old man, was banished, sent into isolation on the island of Patmos. So he writes this book, Revelation, during a time when all the Jesus followers are being persecuted into extinction. So is that what it's about? How to stay alive? Father Thomas smiled. In a way, maybe. What John does is he writes about the end of the world. Like Nostradamus? Predictions? Jen asked, excited to have found something to make her forget her evil dreams. Not exactly. There's probably more debate about Revelation than any other book in the Bible. Some take it literally, like you suggested. Reading the book like something out of Nostradamus. Others take everything as figurative, a way to talk about the Emperor Nero and the other Roman rulers that were butchering Christians in the streets. Still others think that John somehow talking about all of history, a both-and kind of perspective. What do you think? I think there's room enough for lots of interpretations. Father Thomas took his finger and pointed out a specific line. Take this, for instance, Revelation 13, 3 and 4. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. People worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast, and they also worshipped the beast and asked, Who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? You see? Uh, wait, so there's a dragon and a beast? Some say the dragon was Rome, the beast its emperor. Some think this is talking about the Antichrist. Antichrist? What's that? Father Thomas flipped his Bible some pages and read, This is the second letter to the Thessalonians. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders, and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, because they refuse to love the truth and be saved. Therefore God sends them a strong delusion, so that they may believe what is false. The deceiver, that's the Antichrist the one who comes to deceive everyone. Jen didn't want to talk religion, not really. So she didn't say what she was thinking. The Bible just said it was God who sends the strong delusion. Why would God deceive people? Doesn't that make him the bad guy? This memory flooded Jen's mind as she watched the Pied Piper resurrect and impale Marshall Winston. He was dead now. Marshall Winston was dead. His story was over. Nevertheless, he died with at least half a sense of accomplishment. He'd saved the children, right? Without the crow towing, they couldn't perform the evil ritual. I am not a good storyteller. The Pied Piper shouted to the huddling masses. But I am a showman. Fear not, my friends. We need not fret the end of the crow towing. Where we're going, we won't need ancient prophecies or talismans. Piper tapped his still bleeding head. It's all in here. He pointed down at Marshall and addressed the children, the many hundreds lying on the long wooden plank. This man, this man my, children, my children, thought that I didn't understand. understand. He, thought he thought stupidly that I couldn't, that I couldn't understand. understand. 
Piper held his breath and then bursted into a run, flying through the air like a jackal, leaping up onto the wooden plank. His feet stood mere inches from the heads of strapped-down younglings. I'm already dead. I've died and returned to you. This is why I know your aches. I know your pain. I suffer with your worry. I am amidst your strife. You cry out to God for renewal, but am I not your father? I am the one who's felt what you've felt. And because of this, with a vast array of memories to arm me, lifetimes of sorrow as my shield, I alone know what's best for you. Children, you shall die today, and tomorrow you will be with me in paradise. Adam quit addressing the children and shouted out at his old creations. We don't need the Croatoan. The plan is simple. We walk to the Black Henge. We wait. On the summer solstice, we sacrifice the children and watch the door appear. We walk through it. That's it. Who needs a book? The piper smiled, pulled out a fiddle from seemingly nowhere, and began to play the strings. This was Ammon, and the Ammonites were throwing their children into the flames for the great god Moloch. Atticus Further couldn't handle it. Atticus Further could go no farther. He froze. He froze, just like he did when his father was dying. I need help. I need help with this one. I do. I need help. This one last time. I do. I told Jesus I'd not do it myself. I'd never do it myself. Do you understand me? Atticus was silent. God, Lord, answer me. Yes, Father. Yes, Father. Yes, Father. Yes, Father. Yes, Father. Yes, yes, Father. Atticus always freezes at the worst possible times. Scout couldn't see behind her. The wooden plank didn't allow for the type of movement that let you see behind your strapped down position. All she knew was that the persistent voice of her brother chanting, it's okay, it's all right, it's fine, everything's going to be okay, had stopped. Jen noticed just in time. She was once again holding Miles' hand. Why? No good reason. For security, she guessed. She happened to look back, nonchalantly hoping to spot Atticus, actually. she just lost Marshall. She didn't want to lose Atticus, too. He was a puddle on the distance. He'd soon be in shadow, in darkness and cold. Memnock's cloud of warmth wouldn't cover him much longer. He had to get up and move, or he'd be left behind. He'd be gone. Atticus would freeze to death. If we shadows have offended, think but this, and all is mended. That you have but slumbered here while these visions did appear. Remember, scream. Don't forget to scream. With all your lungs, when the time is right, don't hesitate. Scream. Scream. Jen, scream. Atticus! 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 It was the most blood-curdling scream Jen had ever offered. She ran after him. Atticus sat on the cold ice, demurred and decomposed. Get up, Atticus! Jen tried to pull the boy up. Atticus, it's coming! The cold! Get up! She grabbed him under the arms and tried to pick him up. His limp body wouldn't give. Leave me. I failed. No! No! You didn't. Miles! Jen screamed. Miles didn't come. He looked back, but offered no helping hand. Give me your hand if we be friends. A shock of betrayal shook Jen's inner being. This was the end. Everything. Everything was coming undone. The world was ruled by vice. Martial violence. Atticus now, incompetence and defeatism. What was hers? What would do her in? What would undo Jen? Whatever it was, that train was coming fast. Now, 
Jen slipped her whole back under Atticus's and pushed up with her leg muscles. Leave me. Leave me. I can't save her. I can't save her. I can't save her. Leave me. Leave me. Atticus repeated like a lost old man suffering from degenerative Alzheimer's. A voice from within repeated and repeated inside Atticus's head. The soul sucker is coming. He'll suck your soul out of your bones. There's only one way to stop him. Free your soul before he gets here. He's right outside your window now. Tick, tick, tick. He's knocking at the glass. He'll be here soon. Invading. Jen took one step, two. They were already losing. The cold was sweeping in. The processional was leaving them behind. Still, she had Atticus. He wasn't going to die like this. Step. 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 Someone came to help. It's likely not the person you'd suspect. Not Miles. Not a dead Marshal Winston. It was the Piper himself. He had put his fiddle away. He was here to help. Not as a willing participant, but as a necessary concession, Jen shrugged Atticus off her back, and she and the Piper picked the boy up, each with one arm around his or her back. The threesome marched out of the dark and cold night, back into Memnock's moving warmth ring. Why are you... why are you helping? Jen said. He's my son. Isn't everyone? Jen said, staring into his eyes. Yes, he said flatly. You can't let the children die. We're all going to die. They marched in silence. Ten minutes later, they'd caught up. They plopped Atticus atop the edge of the giant wooden plank. The Pied Piper slapped Atticus on the knee. If you'd gone that way, you'd be his. Whose? The question came out of Jen's mouth, not Atticus's. Satan's, Adam said. He grinned a sick grin and pulled out a fight from under his shirt pocket. He played it and danced like the moron he so often appeared to be. Marching. It was a long haul. Atticus lay on the plank, apparently in a self-induced coma. Jen marched, trying not to think about what was coming eminently trying even harder not to think about what happened. Marshall was dead. He tore up the crow towing. Marshall was dead. Just as all skepticism had died in her heart, there was nothing more to resist. It was all true. She was an infant again, inhabiting a world whose rules were beyond her comprehension. Then, they were there, an obsidian column, rising 30 feet high, but more impressively, standing perhaps 30 feet thick, stood imposing against the white landscape. It was the middle of winter, so of course it was dark out, but Memnock's sphere of influence casted a sourceless light, so that Jen could see, easily, that the monolith, like an embiggened version of the one so predominantly exploited in Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, was smooth as silk and edgeless. It was perfectly round at the corners. The myriad creatures, bastard creations of the original man, dove to it like ants to Coca-Cola. Jen watched Mrs. Moose, along with countless others, caress it, lick it, embrace it, worship it. Jen found Miles somewhere behind its shadow. What is it? The Black Henge. Why are they worshipping it? I don't know. He said emotionlessly. This is the end, isn't it? Jen said, grabbing Miles' hand. She chose not to care that he was willing to let Atticus die. It's the end of the world, not the end of the story. What happens after this? Jen asked. Don't know, but we won't have to be afraid anymore. Why? There'll be no one to be afraid of. 
Jen doubted this. Right now, she feared this monolith. There seemed like there was always something to be afraid of. There was always a new unknown that could serve some menace. How could there be story without another unknown? I'm not going through the door. Miles turned to Jen, projecting as he said. We'll go through it. Together. Jen shrugged. Nope. Miles' blood pressure started to rise. Yes. You will go through it with me. She was so nonchalant about her answer. Nope. Yes. Nope. The piper's voice boomed out over the crowd. We must wait until the solstice. Isn't it the middle of winter? Jen whispered. Yes, Miles responded. Sandman will help us through. A small old thing, standing with a cane besides Piper, began pulling dust out of a tweed bag. Every inch of the man was wrinkled. His wrinkles had wrinkles, and he blew his dust. And as he blew his dust, all the creatures of the night fell fast asleep. The children on their planks, once they caught a whiff of the magic dust, fell too into hibernation. Jen and Miles, at the furthest outskirts of the caravan, were the last to go. Jennifer Dash felt only a small tickle crawl up her nose. She tried to bring her hand up to rub out the ticklishness. but she was gone before her hand arrived. The entire crowd was out for nearly six months. There rose on the summer solstice, the black obsidian henge looming dominant over them all. But let us take a minute to reflect on the labyrinthine dreams that Jen had whilst she slumbered. dream starts this way. Now, twelve long hours before the sun will rise and drive them back to darkness. present to you Jennifer Dash, 17 years of age, 5 foot 9, dirty blonde hair falling straight to the small of the back, undeniably pretty, but the type of pretty that doesn't stand out in a crowd. The voice is Itamar Levi's, and he's speaking to his children in the fast food joint. Now, he continues, let me present to you Marshall Winston. Who's that, daddy? One of the girls asks. Jen sips from her unicorn straw a couple rows back. He's just one man. Itamar raises a finger to the sky. Just one man. Do you know what he did? The girls shake their heads. He tore up the book. The oldest book in the world. The girls gasp. (gasps) Did it hurt? It hurt him, yes. It cost him his life. Where is he now? The older of the two girls asks. Right here, Jen says. The girls look at her, but she's not Jen. She's Marshall. Marshall is now sitting across from the girls. He's replaced Itamar Levi. He's him now, but... We're all going to die, children. Just, I got to die first. Do you understand? The girls shake their hands negatively. The younger one is pouting. If we didn't die, then we wouldn't have a purpose, would we? I think we'd have a purpose. We could build a tall building. Is that so? Marshall answers. So, 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 so tall. It'd go on and on and on and on, like a pyramid? No, the other girl says. This is the older one. A black building with no walls and no insides. Marshall's scared. He tries to contain himself. You're talking about the Black Henge. Of course, silly, said the littlest one. But that's not a purpose at all. In order to have purpose, you have to have an ending. Don't you see? That's why your dad called me here, to explain that to you. Worship is an end. I don't know what that means. 
Marshall says, still disturbed. Listen to me. The point is... The point is this. Without death, you can't see what the whole of your life is worth. How's that? Says Jen, now listening in. Marshall turns to her and explains. Most of what we do on a daily basis is trivial. Right? Eat, sleep, brush your teeth. These are mundane, boring details. It's only when we count it all up that we find its answer. What answer? Why are we here? Why are we here? Jen asks. You must know. You're dead. What secrets is death keeping from us? If I said, I'd make a cheater out of you. The dreams went on and on. It's no matter. There was no major insight from them, but since this hibernation took up a full season and a half of Jen's life, it seemed prudent to at least examine an excerpt from her inner mind rumblings. Speaking of rumblings, it was the rumblings that first jolted Jen awake. (gasps) Earthquake. Jagged splits in the ice firmament. Large chunks of ice spilling into the blue abyss. The sun peered down. Quick, 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 quick. Piper's voice boomed out. Quick, 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 quick. A child's age. Some Some may need to take two or three. three. Jen appeared to be the last to wake. Go get Scout, Miles said to Jen. What? Get her before someone else picks her. The various abominations were choosing children's sacrifices like candy. The kids screamed and screamed and screamed. Jen made her way through the cacophony. She had to push her way through the greedy crowd. Virgin blood. It was a run. A run on virgin blood. Get yours while supplies last. We will sell out. Even when the ice breaks, we're happy like a baby. Though the road is long and hard, we try to meet it with a smile. Your death is imminent, and all is heaven sent. Jen pushed past what she guessed was the brother to the minotaur she faced at the druidry. It was nearly the same, except this one had light brown fur. The one that nearly impaled Jen had a darker fur hue. Weird. On the plank, Jen swamped Little Scout into her arms. Atticus was sitting up beside her. Jen grabbed him by the hand. Jen, now holding Scout in her arms like her own daughter, scurried away from the din of the miasma. Atticus followed. Scout nestled into Jen's shoulders, trying to wish away the world she was given. Atticus said nothing. Miles grabbed an older boy, maybe 13. The boy kept trying to escape, taking swipes at him. So Miles choked the young lad out and carried his semi-conscious body over to Jen. Any Any moment moment now? now. When the sun sun is directly directly atop atop the the world, world, on on my my cue, cue. do Do the the final final bidding. bidding. End End them them and and watch watch the door door appear. appear. Piper boomed. Violently, ever so violently, the earth shook. What's happening? Jen cried to Miles. I don't know. He looked to honestly not understand. The ice was splitting everywhere. If this ordeal didn't happen fast, then the whole glacier would combust into disposable parts. The cold sea would eat them all to bits. I think we need to get closer. Miles cried over the earthquake rattling. No, Jen said as she squeezed the scout. The black monolith was twinkling in the daylight. Was it changing color? Was it the door? While her eyes were cast on the black hinge, it gave way. Suddenly, violently, without notice, the ice below the giant volcanic stone gave way and it plummeted into the sea. Hold! 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 
Adam cried out, but he couldn't stop them. Impatient after a millennium of waiting, several of the monsters began slitting open their captors. Wait! Piper's voice was surreally hectic. Insane. The end of the world was insane. Goodbye, Atticus, Jen said. I love you. Miles heard this and had no words. Neither did Atticus. I love you, Scout, Jen said and patted the girl's long hair. I love you, the girl who eats her Cracker Jacks as cereal replied. On some point in the horizon, something was coming. A man. He looked like any other man. Perfectly normal. He dragged something. What was it? A body. He dragged a body. He pulled it to the summit, the highest point of ice surrounding the den of gargoyles. He dropped the body. Everyone saw. Lilith Babbitt. A bloated, horrifically mangled body. But undeniably, Lilith Babbitt. The man spoke. Father, what fools are these? End. The world is broken. Say it again until you believe it. The world is broken. And more than this, good people suffer. Bad people often succeed. Wasn't Lilith Babbitt bad? She murdered an innocent orphan boy. Yet she ascended, escaped the brokenness of this world before the onrushing apocalypse. Didn't she? Now to escape the serpent's tongue, we will make amends ere long. Else the puck a liar call. So good night unto you all. The creatures vanished. They were gone. The rumbling stopped, but Jen saw with her own eyes, when it was just her, Atticus, Miles, and Scout that stood at the North Pole, she saw that day, for the first time, the outline of Leviathan. In the chasm into the sea that the Black Henge's descent had left, Jen saw a monstrous beast swimming just under the surface. Leviathan had come to eat them all, but the Shining Man had spoiled it. Jennifer, Atticus, Miles, even the Piper himself, none of them would fully understand how the Shining Man came to them, just in time to show the creations their father's ruse. But you may know, listener, what they did not. Marshall called him. Marshall had prayed to the Shining Man for help. And he came. Piper's plan was simple. Miles had convinced the monsters that there was a door. Piper knew better. There's no ancient knowledge, no primordial secret. There's no door that can be levied into existence like a curse or blessing. But reality didn't matter. What mattered was that Adam's creatures believed it was possible. So then, Piper called upon all to come north, where he planned to have the world finally end. Leviathan would eat the children of Anmo, along with all the old ones, and the world would end. And with its ending, the Shining Man wouldn't continue to gain souls and strength. There was never going to be a door. Leviathan was the center of Piper's plan. She was the great beast below the earth that the Druidry worked so hard to keep at rest. She was the monster Jen heard moaning in its morning ritual, slowly rising from slumber, back when Jen paced the thousand steps downward on Pishtaco's island. Leviathan was the eater of the world. The final checkpoint the end of the story. But today the end didn't come. The Shining Man and showing off the corpse of Lilith Babbitt scared the old ones away. If Lilith Babbitt's door was false, then this new door, supposedly opened by the same book, would also only lead to death. Lilith Babbitt ascended into the heavens. That was videotaped. She ascended and promptly fell back to Earth. There is no door. There is no door. We're all going to die, because there is no door. Give me your hands if we be friends, and Robin shall restore amends. A sea of dread and resignation in his eyes. He looked to Jen and said, I failed you. End of part three. Hey 
everybody. That brings us to the end of part three of Solve the World. Thank you for listening so long and so hard. Uh, a couple of people I want to especially thank today are Justin Boats. Justin has provided the voice of Pied Piper for us since episode 51 through episode 80 right now. He's done a fantastic job, and I can't thank him enough. Thank you, Justin. Similarly, uh, the theme song for Marshall Winston's Downfall comes from a song entitled Tragedy by Richard McGraw. I want to thank Mr. McGraw with my whole heart for letting me use his wonderful, wonderful music. Please, please, please check out Richard McGraw's music at richardmcgraw.bandcamp.com. Okay, as is our tradition on Solve the World, we take a month off after the end of each part. So, unfortunately for you eager beavers, you're going to have to wait a month before you get episode 81. Now, there's some good news in the bad news. First off, as I like to do every once in a while, we're going to have a noob recap here in just a few weeks, just a couple weeks. Uh, the reason that I do these things is, one, if you have friends that you think would be really into the show but don't want to start from page one that want to be right where you are in the story, you can just shove them towards these noob recaps and they can get more or less caught up without having to go through the 30 hours plus of episodes 1 through 79, or 1 through 80, excuse me. The other reason is because, I don't know, maybe I'm OCD, but since there's so much ambiguity in the world that Jen lives in, I don't want there to be ambiguity in the story itself. So these little episodes are just my attempt to get us all on the same page. If there's any major mythology you happen to miss for one reason or another, or the story didn't convey that information really well, this is kind of a get-out-of-jail-free card for me, where I can just be like, here's the story! <laughs> uh, so it's not for everyone, but it's a little something. Usually those episodes are pretty short. Um, it's not canon. It's just a free will offering. We also have a tradition at this point of doing a Solving the World premium episode during these breaks. These are episodes where I just answer listener questions. So this time around, we did a Solving the World episode not too long ago, right after uh, The Glass House. So I don't really know if there's enough questions out there to fill out an episode. If there is, I'm happy to do so. So here's the challenge. If you have any question, it can be a question about the story, about Pied Piper, about the mythology, about the color of Jen's hair. Uh, anything like that, or personal questions, if you want to ask me what my favorite high school teacher was, you're welcome to do that. Um, if I get a dozen or so questions, we'll do this thing. If I only get six or seven, then probably not going to invest the time to do this, this go-round. All right, so if you want more content, the answer's simple. Interact with me. Write me questions. Uh, you can write to me directly at Dante Stack at Gmail. That's my personal email account. I'm always there. Not always there. I don't live in the email, but you understand. Um, that's D-A-N-T-E-S-T-A-C-K at gmail.com. Another way to interact, ask me a question, is our Facebook page, facebook.com slash solve the world podcast. Uh, the joy of writing your question there is you might have other listeners that interact with your question right then and there or answer your question. So that's fun. Shout out to Mr. Wyatt Harvey, who has been the preeminent Facebook poster. I appreciate you, sir. Thanks for all the posts and interaction. Um, one other way is on Twitter. My Twitter handle is just at Dante Stack. I use it for other things besides Solve the World, so I don't have a Solve the World specific one. But at Dante Stack, you can reach me, write me a question there. So those are the three ways. Again, if I get enough questions, we'll do a Solving the World premium episode. Now, a little more business to cover here. The Solve the World Society. If you're kind of in the dark on what that is, it's pretty much just my way of thanking the hardcore fans, the hardcore listeners, people that interact with the show. Solve the World is a labor of love for me. I'm not getting famous. I'm not getting rich off this enterprise. Um, but what I get back out of it, besides creating it, there's a joy in seeing you guys interact with it. So the Society is my way of thanking you listeners who go a step farther and interact some way with the content. So right now, there's three ways to get into the Society. A, you can do any fan art. Send that fan art to me, again, at my email, 
account, Dante Stack at Gmail, or on Facebook, and let me post it online on our Facebook page, and voila, you're in the society. I'll send you the password to get through the page, and then you'll have access to all the premium content. Other way is to blog about Solve the World. Uh, a bunch of people have been doing this recently. That's really cool. Um, it extends our internet footprint, so it's a help. And it's always fun to see what people are thinking about and what is most interesting to different listeners. And, of course, fan theories are always fun. So, blog, draw me a picture. <laughs> and the third way, which I'm only making available right now during this interlude time between episode 80 and 81, is if you donate to me, tip me. Go to our tip jar page, dantestack.com slash T-I-P dash J-A-R, tip jar. Donate via PayPal or Stripe, at least $5 or more. So it's a pay-to-play type of business right here. But if you donate $5 or more, I'll give you instant access to Solve the World Society. So last thing here, while I'm not producing any content for the main, you know, iTunes account right now for the next month, uh, the Solve the World Society will be getting new releases for future episodes-ish. So part four, when it is released, is going to feel a little different than parts one, two, and three. Mainly, the big difference is, at least for the first few episodes, for a little while, I'm going to be releasing the main episode on Tuesdays as normal, but then Friday of every week... I'm going to be releasing what we call the U-Club speeches, um, mini-sodes, if you will. And that'll be Tuesday you'll get a release, regular episode, following Jen and all that, and then Friday you'll get these U-Club speeches. Um, and, you know, when the episodes start going, you'll understand how they relate to the main storyline. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, but society members, right now there's already one of those U-Club episodes up. And every week, starting next week, I'm going to release another one. So before episode 81 comes out, you're already, you know, four or five Fridays ahead of regular listeners. So that's my incentive for society members. I hope that sounds nice. Um, and the U-Club speeches are really different. Um, I think you'll enjoy them. So again, thanks, guys. I'm going to sit back and take a breath here. It's been a long stretch up to this episode 80. Um, it's a lot of work doing this last episode. Thank you for listening. I appreciate you guys. I'll officially see you in a month. All right? Whew.